In this WrestleTalk news, Arn Anderson says he and Brock are in limbo in AEW, the real reason a former WWE star quit the company, Tempest review of NXT 2.0, and more. Subscribe and enable notifications to always on for daily wrestling news videos. Support WrestleTalk! Arn Anderson has been a key feature of AEW programming since its launch, mainly managing Cody but also being featured alongside FTR, as well as his son Brock Anderson. Also his other son, Glock Anderson. But with AEW going through a huge amount of growth in its roster size since its launch, adding huge players like Brian Danielson, Keith Lee, Adam Cole, Swerve Strickland, and more, some others haven't been featured as prominently on the card as is the nature of things. However, with Cody also leaving AEW, Arn Anderson has found himself a bit lost. And now speaking on ad-free shows, Arn has clarified his AEW status by saying that both he and his son Brock show up to TV every week, but that currently they are both in limbo. Arn then spoke on what some perceive as stop-start pushes in AEW, with talent being cycled in and out and being featured for a few weeks on Dynamite and Rampage before being used more on Dark and Dark Elevation again. If you remember correctly, Brock's debut match was partners with Cody. They had a really good match with QT Marshall and one of the other kids, Aaron Solo. It's been so far back that nobody remembers it. He had his three or four weeks. In order to get a person over, you have to have about eight, 10 or 12 straight weeks of good TV. Now I'm invested in this guy. I do agree that talent doesn't get exposed. Dante Martin is a very special kid. He had springs not like anybody else in the business. A short time back, he had two, three, four really good weeks and now they disappear down to dark. It's a dilemma we have, we will figure it out. The dilemma he speaks of could be referring to how to book certain AEW talent in order to get them over, or it could be have been saying that he and Brock have some thinking to do about their AEW future. What do you think they should do? Let us know in the comments below. Someone else's wrestling future that's up in the air right now is Johnny Gargano's, who left NXT last year and has taken time away to be with his family as he welcomed his first child, Quill, into the world. Gargano has started to appear at wrestling conventions and the like, but his in-ring return is unconfirmed right now. Gargano's departure from WWE was around the same time NXT had its multicolored redesign into NXT 2.0, so many fans naturally assumed this was a factor in Gargano deciding to leave the company. But according to Gargano himself on Rene Paquette's oral sessions, this is not the case. I know people said like, oh, Johnny left because NXT changed. No, I always had it in my mind that I wasn't going to leave to any particular place. I kind of just felt like I needed to go because I felt like if you watch TV shows, or if you watch anything in general, if you see the same character, and obviously I changed character, I turned heel, I did funny stuff, I did things like that here and there, but if you see the same person on TV for five years, six years, it gets stale. That's some good self-awareness from Gargano, though personally I could watch him do his thing for another 17 years before he got boring to me. He's a good lad. And now Hot Tag to Tempest for his review of last night's Go Home episode of NXT 2.0 before Stand and Deliver this weekend. I really gotta make sure I get all my thoughts out in this review now, don't I? What's going on, Russell Talk friends and fans? Tempest is back with another review of NXT 2.0 in about five minutes. So this show starts off with a six-man tag team match as Imperium took on LA Knight and MSK. Before the match could get underway, the babyfaces attack the heels from behind and isn't that a weird sentence? Remember when the heels used to do the dastardly things on wrestling shows? Man, what a time. Once things got a little bit settled down, we actually had a very fun opening match here. Six-man tags are almost always fun on WWE TV and this one was no different. Any show that has a Walter match on it gets that much better and I really like that they took the opportunity to give Imperium a big win in this match ahead of their NXT tag team title match on Saturday. Saturday. It's been a long time since Marcel Bartel and Fabian Eichner were just allowed to stand tall as tag team champions. This was their first win in almost two months. Eichner and Bartel were able to hit their big high-low finish on Nash Carter for the win, and then afterwards they were confronted by the Creed brothers as all three teams had a weird standoff that I always wonder what happens after they cut to black. Do they all just say, all right, we're done staring. Let's all go backstage at the same time. Nitpicks aside, this was a very fun opener. Walter is still the man. This gets a four out of five. Next, we had a very surprising match in the form of Ivy Nile versus Tiffany Stratton. Now, I'll be honest. I have not been super impressed with Tiffany Stratton so far, but that changed tonight. She had a fantastic standing moonsault. Gold star for that. I thought Stratton looked much more comfortable in this match than she has recently, and that just might be because Ivy Nile is that damn good. We've had discussions on recent NXT podcasts about who should be the top star of the NXT 2.0 women's division, and I don't think there's any doubt that it should be Ivy Nile. She's got a great look, she's very impressive, her finisher is awesome, and all of her matches are fun. What more could you ask for? Nile was able to submit Stratton with the standing front bulldog choke, and this was so much better than I thought it was going to be. This was basically the same length as a squash match, but so much better than NXT squash matches have been. Four out of five, Ivy Nile for NXT Women's Champion. We got a really great backstage promo from Tommaso Ciampa, who really summed up his time in NXT before not throwing his chair, but placing it against the wall with his start and end dates in NXT. 
Mwah. Would be nice if maybe the biggest NXT star of all time had a bigger opponent. And then we had the next match as Legato del Fantasma took on Josh Briggs and Brooks Jensen. Now the middle chunk of this show did not feel like a go home show for Stand and Deliver whatsoever, and this match was a big part of that. There was some play between Electra Lopez and Fallon Henley, god damn these names. But Joaquin Wilde tried to hit a 450 splash as Josh Briggs caught him by the throat, hit a big choke slam before tagging in Brooks Jensen, and they hit the up and under lariat for the win. This really was just a match. Very unremarkable, and personally, I have a very hard time getting into Brooks Jensen's matches now that they've made him a complete joke. Two out of five. I'm not going to remember this match in T-minus five minutes. We got confirmation that Index is going to face Duja at Stand and Deliver, and that might be the worst sentence I've ever said in my life. And then we got an in-ring promo from Toxic Attraction. Oh boy. Mandy Rose cuts the exact same promo she's been cutting since her return to NXT, and Gigi Dolan says that there are just no tag teams in NXT. Yeah, we know. It sucks. Earlier in the show, Dakota Kai had found seemingly the dismembered remains of Wendy Chu, her slippers, her onesie, and her pillow was all torn up like someone had shanked it. They might as well have left a chalk outline of Wendy Chu. But Dakota comes out to avenge her friend, and she is backed up by Raquel Gonzalez. The two of them fight off toxic attraction, and then it looks like they're gonna have an intense stare down where they remember all their history, but... No, they just made up on the spot and hugged. It's really weird. I've heard the theory that Wendy Chu was able to teach Dakota Kai how to trust people and how to be friends with people again. A very impressive feat to accomplish in three weeks, no doubt. But there's no reason that Raquel Gonzalez should be this willing to take Dakota Kai back after everything that they've gone through together. Why would you trust Dakota Kai? She's the person who turns on people. But I think it would have been a much more interesting story if Dakota Kai had to earn back the trust of Raquel Gonzalez over time. Like how Seth Rollins had to do with Dean Ambrose back in 2017. That being said, I am pleased to see Raquel Gonzalez and Dakota Kai back together as a team. I just wish it was handled better. Neither has really done anything of note since they split, and putting them back together just makes more sense. You need tag teams on this show. This segment was a real mixed bag. The promo wasn't very good, but the brawl was kind of fun. I'm going to give this a 2 out of 5. Really brought down by that promo. And then we had our next match as Von Wagner took on Bodie Hayward. The reigning and defending number one storyline that Tempest could not give a shit less about on NXT. What is a Von Wagner? I'll be honest guys, during this match there was a strong part of me that wanted to just turn off the show and say, you know what, I'll make it to this part in the review and say, sorry, this show sucks, moving on. Because they brought out the Japanese announce table again, because it's just so funny that they're from another country. Somebody saved my boy Kushida, I'm dying. This was another nothing match, Von Wagner hit his spinning side slam on Bodie Hayward for the win, and then afterwards beat up Jacket Time and ripped up Ikman Jiro's jacket. Should've kept that jacket, it would've been the most interesting thing he's ever worn. The match itself in a vacuum might not have been that bad, but with the commentary and just the whole storyline going into this, this gets a 1 out of 5. Next we had another squash match as Nikita Lyons took on Sloane Jacobs. NXT 2.0 sure loves its squash matches and this was another one. Nikita Lyons won with her split-legged leg drop and after the match Lash Legend cut a promo on the screen saying that she and Nikita Lyons have some unfinished business to attend to. Sure, all right, whatever. You know what I mean when I say this didn't feel like a go-home show? It was a fine squash match, nothing wrong with it, nothing special, two out of five. But then the main event appeared to save this show. Yes, we had the last chance qualifier match for the North American Championship ladder match to stand and deliver as Cameron Grimes took on Roderick Strong and A-Kid. Now I will just say, this is one of the best NXT matches of the whole year. This might be the best NXT match of the whole week. Thankfully, despite this very high bar, I do believe stand and deliver will be able to pull that off, especially with the ladder match involving Cameron Grimes. Grimes. Yes, after a stellar main event of perfectly timed transitions from three of the best pros in NXT, Cameron Grimes was able to hit the cave in on Roderick Strong, sealing his spot in the North American Championship ladder match. I cannot tell you how much fun this match was. And A-Kid got a little bit more of an entrance this week. He's getting closer to a full one. I absolutely love all three of these guys, and I really, really love this match. This match gets a five out of five. Of course, afterwards, Carmelo and Trick Williams brawled with all the competitors from the North American Championship ladder match as we went off the air. This was a very good go-home angle, I just wish the rest of the show lived up to this standard. So overall, the highs of this show were really, really high, but the lows of this show are just so bad. I don't know why more focus wasn't put on the matches of Stand and Deliver. Like, why couldn't we get an in-ring promo from Braun Breaker or Dolph Ziggler or the Creed Brothers instead of just backstage vignettes? I'd much rather see the show spent that way than with Vaughn Wagner and Brooks Jensen. Regardless, this is going to be another middle-of-the-road NXT where the good stuff is up here, the bad stuff is out here, and they balance out to a 3 out of 5. And that's just a barrap stuff for me. If you want to hear more about this episode, make sure you go over to the newly christened Mocha 2.0 NXT podcast over on Russell Talk Podcast later on today, and you will get all the sweet SP3 and Satin Yangi love. What's not to love about that? Go with no. And promo. 
Did I book it as a title match? Did I make it a title match? Did I put the title on the line? I honestly, I honestly don't remember. I hope I did, but I don't remember. I've got, you've got to have a show with Tucker in it, right? But I've got a plan here, I've got a plan. I've got a plan, 